third symposium in the year uh, 2021. Uh, the symposium day is hosted quarterly in the month of March and in the month of June. And this is the third one in the month of September. And subsequent to that, then uh, in the month of uh, November and December, we host the African International Mediation Week, which is a full week of nothing else but mediation for mediators. So today being the on Thursday, the 23rd day of uh, the year 2021, this is our fourth session in the Mediation Day Symposium. And as our fourth session, this is the session where we are focusing on conciliation in the workplace. Conciliation is a practice that has commonly been used in the workplace and it's also touted to be a good uh, option for consideration either to build on mediation skills or on the other hand as an additional service that mediators can be able to provide and also can be used and applied by other dispute resolution professionals in advancing their career within the area of dispute uh, resolution. And so with that, we will start off with the words of the Kenyan National Anthem and then be able to uh, invite our uh, presenter for the guest lecture that we have today. And that is um, our mediator, Phyllis Lane Wangwe, whom I will introduce right after the National Anthem. So tutasema wimbo wa taifa wa nchi ya Kenya kwa lugha ya Kiswahili na nitaongoza. E mungu nguvu yetu ilete baraka kwetu haki iwe ngao na mlinzi na tukae na undugu amani na uhuru raha tupate na ustawi we say the national anthem as a prayer to uh, for our nation the people of kenya and also the entire world so welcome once again ladies and gentlemen to this uh, conversation and uh, as i indicated this is a fourth session in a series of five sessions uh, during the quarter three mediation day symposium. As the fourth session, this is our in evening uh, sundowner session uh, being a 5 p.m. Uh, session for us. And this is a guest lecture uh, masterclass as part of our effective mediator masterclass series. And today we have a guest lecture and uh, this is uh, none other than Phyllis Elaine and, uh, N. Wangwe. Phyllis is a gazetted conciliator with the Ministry of Labor Kenya. She is an advocate. She is also a mediator and a conciliator. And she is the founder of Center for Economic Empowerment and Development, or in short form, SEED, C -E 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 -D. So dispute resolution is part of what uh, uh, Phyllis uh, Wangwe does, and so, it's been quite an interesting of uh, a great opportunity to be able to invite her as a conciliator to be able to come and speak to us and enlighten us on what conciliation is. As Wasili and I have, we find that the workplace is a hotbed to disagreements and is an opportunity for mediators. And that is why we have this session to, uh, today so that we can be able to have mediators understand or appreciate the role and the place of a conciliator and perhaps be able to add it on as a feather to, the, to their cup in service to society and also into their practice. So as our uh, for fourth session uh, for, uh, at Wasilian Hub today, Mediator Phyllis Wangwe, sure. Ujambo. Uh, si Ujambo, Mediator Phyllis Wangwe. Si Jambo, yeah, man. it's good to man, see you. Yeah. Yes, we hear you well. So I wish to be able to invite you, if we may, so that you can be able to take on the session. Please uh, introduce yourself uh, based on the role, the, what you do, what you enjoy to do, and also what you do professionally as you take us through the session on conciliation for this hour. Karibu sana. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. I'm very humbled to be here today to just be able to discuss um, with the people here today what I'm very passionate about. So as Mediator Wangare has uh, introduced me, I'm Phyllis Elena Machanja Wangwe. I'm a practicing advocate of the High Court of Kenya. And uh, maybe a little of my background so that you, some others may understand how I happen to be here today. I started out as a banker. And when I was in banking, 
I, the, an opportunity came back, came for me to go back to school. So I went back to school and I did, a, I did my law degree. I did my law degree at the same time when I was reading, which means <clears throat> when I was working, which means it was simultaneous. The fourth year of my law degree, I, I discovered ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution. And I was very shocked. You can imagine from first year to fourth year, I never knew about ADR. So it was until fourth year uh, that I learned about ADR and I found it to be such a beautiful subject. And I wondered how come I never knew about it? How come that there's such a beautiful concept that is never practiced? So right from fourth year, I, I, I really gained interest in ADR. And uh, after, after I graduated, went to law school and finished, you find that even on, when I, I, I didn't leave the bank immediately, I continued working in the bank. And it was at that time that I got an opportunity to start, uh, to start uh, practicing my, my ADR skills in one way or the other. And it's interesting that uh, there are many things that many of my fellow bankers were not even aware of. What all the bankers knew is that once a matter went to court, it was final. It had to go till the judgment. And at, at that time, I was working with National Bank, and um, the, the clients were always told, the matter has gone to court, there's nothing we can do about it. The matter has gone to court, there's nothing we can do about it. Then I, that, that, that time, I was now in the recovery division. So I looked at quite a, quite a number of the bad and doubtful debts in the bank, and I was like, gosh, these debts, I feel they are debts that we can be able to negotiate and get them off the court, off the court records. And um, they were hesitant, but I told them, no, I feel we can do it. And at that time, I talked to the general manager and I, was, I, I told the general manager, these matters are in court, but I'm sure if we talk to these clients, this customer of ours, I'm sure we should be able to reach a, dis, a, 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 a resolution. And the manager agreed. And interestingly, about 90 to 99% of the people we negotiated with actually agreed to pay up their loans. Of course, we gave them a discount and the matters were pulled out of court. And there my traction and interest in ADR continued. When I was still in the bank, I got into mediation, I got into, into arbitration. And how I got into conciliation actually is by being out there and sharing with the public, making them more aware of the benefits of ADR that uh, just one day I found myself appointed. Uh, actually, I just found on the WhatsApp everywhere I was going, I was being told, congratulations, 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 congratulations. I had no idea what it was about. But then I had been appointed as a conciliator under the Ministry of Labor. Yes, so that is the way I, 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 I ended up having this hat that has really been uh, good. I've, I've enjoyed it. It's, it's opened many doors. And uh, yes, I've been able to to carry out my passion passionately in this field of where there are disputes. So basically that's Phyllis. Phyllis is a mother of three and I, I like life. I believe in being happy. I believe in laughing. So I, you can see generally I like harmony. So I'm an, yes, I'm an advocate. And I usually tell people, let us settle out of court. And if they don't want us to settle out of court, fine, we go to court. And of course, once we reach court, the rules are different. And I've seen quite a number of my clients being very disappointed that they insisted we go to court or because I, you know, the gamble is very different in ADR. It does not mean we can't fight, but we are choosing to be harmonious. But if you insist we go to court, then fine. Let's go to court and fight it out. So yes, that's the way I am. I am in conciliation, ADR generally. And it's, it's a trip that I'm enjoying. It's a process, it's, it's a process. It's a process, it's a journey. It's, um, it's a lifestyle for me and I really do enjoy it. Yes, so that is basically a, a little about me. And what else do I like? I like my children. I have three beautiful girls. I like farming, kwabdomwa. I always get people to do it for me, but I just like seeing things sprouting out. So that's basically Phyllis in a snapshot. So are we ready to go? Yes. So conciliation. Yes, we, yeah, yeah, yes, we, yeah, yes, we are ready to sprout. Thank you very much for introducing yourself a bit further. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so that we relax. Uh, and, uh... Yes, yes. I was just appreciating, you know, we, we, we have the, as you've just said, just so that we can get to know um, exactly where I, what makes you have to be a conciliator. That, that background has really been useful, just understanding your banking, uh, your background as a banker, and then you studying, and then 
quite interesting, as you said, discovering uh, the alternative dispute resolution in your fourth year when you now went back as a banker to study to study law. And that's quite an interesting uh, uh, remark because uh, we would expect that you actually got to know about mediation, arbitration, conciliation, you know, in your first year. But I think that's a discussion for some other time, but I, I, which is a great thing that probably today more and more of the students who are in business school, students who are in law school and also in social sciences, they are opting to take up mediation or getting to know about it. So welcome and uh, please take us through yeah, your segment, Karibu. Thank you. So that's, uh, that's how I landed in conciliation and I'm happy to be here today. So what is conciliation? Do we understand what conciliation is? Uh, but even before we get into conciliation, before there is conciliation, there has to be what we are seeing on the screen. And what I always say, whenever there are two people somewhere, whenever, whenever, whenever there are two people, just even as in Adam and Eve, there is likely to be a point whereby the two people will not agree on one point or the other. Uh, we always say even twins, you'll find at some point they disagree. So you find in every contract, in every, in every contract, in every arrangement, we always have to have room for an exit clause in case anything goes wrong. How do you deal with it? And we should not be shocked when disputes do arise. Disputes do arise due to different, uh, dif different uh, issues and disputes uh, or um, difference of opinions does not mean that we are weak in any way, but many times these differences of opinions, of opinions make us strong in how we deal with the disputes. So whenever we find that uh, people are not agreeing on a contract or in an area of life, then we say a dis what, what it, it generates from conflict to dispute. So when you have, when you're not agreeing, find this that, but when you're completely not agreeing, when you're not seeing eye to eye and each one is now is insisting on his own part, then we say a dispute has a reason. We can see there's this man here and this other man is the man in brown and there's the one in jungle green and the referee comes in between there. And that is where we usually come in as conciliators or, or as neutrals in one way or the other. So disputes are a normal issue of life and how we deal with them, how we deal with them is what determines what comes out of it, whether we come out stronger or weaker, whether the, the scenario gets better for us or worse, worse for us. So it's very important that we, we master our skills on how to deal with these issues. And when, we, and when we cannot deal with them as individuals, how the people around us should be able to deal with issues, or now we as neutrals, how we deal with issues when we are invited as neutrals where, where a dispute has arisen. So uh, today we are talking about conciliation, but I, I felt it was very important that we understand uh, the importance of the Employment Act and the Labor Relations Act. You see, the Employment Act actually defines, the, the Employment Act uh, defines the relationship between employers and employees. So according to the Employment Act, I've actually just quoted the preamble, the Employment Act declares and defines fundamental rights of employees to provide basic conditions of employment of employees, to regulate employment of children, and to provide for matters connected with the foregoing. That is Employment Act. Basically, what that means is that the Employment Act deals with a relationship, the relationship within a working environment between those that have been employed and those that are employed. In the Labor Relations Act, the Labor Relations Act on the other side consolidates the law relating to trade unions and trade disputes to provide for the registration, regulation, management, democratization of trade unions and employers and employers organizations or federations to promote sound labor relations through protection and promotion of freedom of association, the encouragement of collective bargaining and promotion of orderly and expeditious dispute settlement conducive to social justice and economic development for the, for the connected purposes. So we find that when, um, when, the, when there is, and when, the, when two institutions come into play, we find that 
we now move away from the Employment Act and use the Labor Relations Act to, to address the issues and any disparities and any disputes that may, may, may arise between the institution. The Employment Act refers to the employee's environment. The Labor Relations Act refers now to the different labor institutions, different labor institutions, uh, different institutions that are in one way or the other affected by the employees. That's where we, you can see we are talking about the trade unions, the, the federations, the federations and the like. So it's important that we know the difference between these two. Now, just a, a bit of it, you'll find that when there is an issue in the Employment Act, we go through what we call the disciplinary process. So you find the Employment Act usually refers to the disciplinary process, whereby within the disciplinary process, the, the, the rules, there are the rules of natural justice, whereby somebody is accused of something and uh, a presentation is made, there's the notice to show cause and he's listened to and all that, and it, eventually a decision is made. That dispute, that, uh, um, that, that uh, what we call it, the, the disciplinary action, is what is covered uh, very, very elaborately in the Employment Act. And you find that is not conciliation per se, because then when we are dealing with that, you find there's the employer and the employee. We don't really have a neutral in these particular cases. Now, when it comes to the Labor Relations Act, now there, because there are different specific, clearly different institutions, that is now when we find neutrals coming in. Neutrals by neutrals, I mean an independent third party who has no interest in the matter whatsoever and just simply wants to see how these people can have an, a harmony. I wanted to have this, I want us to have this at the back of our minds so that you, you realize why we're talking, when we're talking of conciliation, it's really coming under the Labor Relations Act. Now, when we have, uh, when we have uh, disputes, we have uh, different forms of uh, re resolving disputes. And we have at the bottom, of course, I've given five here, but there are more than this, but these are the general ones. We have litigation, whereby when it is litigation, we have to go through the whole court process and we know the, the benefits and the uh, challenges of litigation. Litigation is not very costly when it comes to the, the, the amounts that are involved many times, but the problem many times with litigation, we find that uh, we have to go by the court's diary we have to go by the court's diary. We don't get to choose our judge. We don't get to choose so many things, but we are, and we have to go by we have to go by the decision that is made by the judge. Now that is in the courts. In arbitration, arbitration is a bit more gentle compared to litigation, but it's not very far off from arbitration, because in arbitration we get an arbitrator. An arbitrator is also a neutral third party. But we find from practice, when we are picking an arbitrator, and we usually tend to pick somebody, an expert in that particular area. And uh, in arbitration, you can find, we find that we have arbitrators who are good in marine issues, who are good in commercial issues, different kinds of transactions, because we find many times, actually when it comes to arbitration, it's usually arising out of the breach of a contract. But the contract depends on which sector of the economy is affected. And many times we'll want, we get, sometimes we get to choose the arbitrator, or we at least give the indications of the kind of arbitrator that we want, who signs in almost like a judge. The arbitrator will listen to the two parties or the three parties, but, uh, we, but um, we listen to the two or three parties. And then you find the diaries usually have to agree on how the matter proceeds. You find in litigation, many times the judge just gives direction, just gives orders of what should be done. But in, in arbitration, you tend to agree because you can even agree on the venue, the place, because it doesn't have to be in court. The parties will agree. Now on conciliation, conciliation now comes a little, a little lower, not lower in terms of rank, but in terms of maybe I'll call it stiffness. Whereby you find now in conciliation, you have a neutral third party also, also trying to help the parties agree. The difference between conciliation and arbitration is that when it comes to the conciliator, the conciliator does not really make any binding decision over the parties. The conciliator will tend to prompt the parties, see where they are stuck and give them an idea 
of how to move on with a particular process. But the parties, they are the ones who decide. So the conciliator tends to be a bit more active, a bit more active compared to mediation and will suggest here and there. And depending on the, on the authority that is appointing the conciliator, the conciliator, for example, under the Ministry of Labor, at the end of it all, I do a report, which I don't do when I'm a mediator. You see, in conciliation, you have to do a report of the whole session. What happened, what you have agreed, and what you've not agreed. You have to put it there. You can even indicate the conduct of the parties and all that. Yes, it's confidential, but you find, depending on who has given you the authority to do the work, they use usually a report that you do. Mediation, on the other part, as a neutral, as a neutral, you don't get to decide anything. You only encourage the parties to come up with a decision. And once they come up with a decision, you can help them document the decision and that decision, that consent now is binding upon the parties under normal circumstances when it is now recorded in court. Negotiation is also much lower than, uh, than a bit lower again than, than uh, mediation. It's, it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, informal. It's quite informal. And this is really just getting the parties to agree before things get too, too tough. So you, you see that is where, that is where the, the differences are in the different, in the different modes of, of, uh, of dispute resolution. But you, other than that, you have things like med up, you have expert determination and the like. There are quite a number of other modes of dispute resolution that are there. So when we, when, for me, I'll, when it comes to conciliation in the workplace, now in this particular case, I love to talk about it from the Labor Relations Act. So we find that, which I've just explained to you, that the Labor Relations Act usually uh, uh, guides the relationship between the different institutions that are involved when there is a dispute amongst, amongst, the, amongst the employees, for one reason or the other. So part four of the Labor Relations Act provides for the procedures of dispute resolution in the workplace. And it's actually very, very elaborate on that. So you find that in part four, there are, there are different, uh, different uh, uh, aspects that are covered in, in, in detail, kind of giving a direction as to what the parties should, um, what the parties uh, should, how, how, the party, how the process should go. So the, the part four, it provides for reporting of trade, trade disputes to the minister, that is now the minister of labor. And then it also provides for the respondents filing the replying statement. Then the interested party, the times you find that even when there are disputes, it's not only the parties, but they'll find that sometimes there's, there's one or two other parties. The interested party might also may also file a statement of interest. So there's that provision of that. The part four of, um, of uh, the Labor Relations Act also provides for the minister to appoint conciliators and then you'll find that is under section 65. And then you'll find again under section 70 again, the minister can also again appoint uh, conciliators in public interest. And that section, so you'll find the difference between section 65 and section 70 is that in section 70, it's public interest, particularly when the parties are not agreeing. And even now there's an impeding strike. So that you find that by the time the minister is appointing a conciliator, it's in the public interest of the of the community. Uh, the act also provides for the persons to be appointed to conciliate. And then we also have the conciliator's powers are also clearly stipulated in the, in the, in the, in the act. And then the, it also provides for the specific disputes that uh, the conciliator that can be brought before conciliation and also how disputes that have been unresolved, how they are to be dealt with. And then also it talks of the committee of inquiry if needs be, and the exercise of powers of the minister. So that's just in a snapshot of what part four of the Labor Relations Act uh, uh, provides. And that is where technically where conciliation is. And, uh, and yes, that is where we get our authority, usually once under Minister of Labor to act as conciliators, you are appointed by the peers. So generally, We've said conciliation is an adjustment and settlement of a dispute in a friendly and non-antagonistic manner by using non-binding procedure. 
And I, I say non-binding because you find that um, even when at some point I do write a report, like there can be a conciliation and I write a report. Yes, that report is going to guide them because there are times you find the conciliation has, uh, the conciliation actually sometimes the directions have come from the court, the employment, the employment court decides, no, this, this is a matter that you go through conciliation. And once the matter is coming to conciliation from court, then it means even the report that you do will also be furnished to the court. If conciliation uh, orders or instructions are from the minister, the report that I do will go to the minister. Now with the report, usually I will just write everything that has gone on, what my findings are and all that. And uh, depending on how I, I put it as a, as a chief, as a chair of the conciliation cause, but then I'll work with my team, depending on how we put it, it will give guidance on the minister or the judge on how to proceed with the matter. And that is why we say it's non-binding. But uh, it's, uh, it's non-binding, I'd say in quotes, specifically because you find they will not act on it as is, but it will help them decide on the way forward. So the most, uh, the most important method of reconciliation is the most important method for prevention and settlement of industrial disputes through third party intervention. These disputes under the Labor Relations Act are what we call industry disputes. It means different institutions when they're at loggerheads in one way or the other. Those are now the industrial. Whenever you hear industrial disputes, that's what we are talking about. Um, the settling of disputes without litigation, that is what uh, conciliation is. It is a method of settlement, as I've, as I've told you, depending on at what point it is. Sometimes the parties will agree just from the very beginning, let us get a conciliator and see how to move on with this without having going to go to the minister. At other times, it only comes in after they, after they have not completely agreed and they are issuing strikes of notices and that is when the minister comes in and appoints a conciliator. So it's a process by which discussion between the parties is kept going through the participation of a conciliator as I'd, as I'd explained uh, earlier and it brings both parties of dispute into harmony. That is basically what uh, conciliation is. Okay, it's, conciliation is limited to encouraging the parties to discuss their differences and to help them develop their own proposed solutions. So that you'll find that what, when I sit with, a, with, with one group of people, what we come up with or what, what they come up with does not have to look, let's say between Jane and Mary, what Jane and Mary come up with does not have to look exactly the same as what Peter and John come up with. It is customized and it is depending on the different circumstances. Because, because one of the things as we go further, you'll find that we say there's the, the element of interest. And because it's the element of interest, you find that the way you, the way you resolve disputes is different depending on the circumstances and as you move from one, from one, from one circumstance to the other. So um, conciliation is voluntary, it's flexible, it's confidential. It's not like in the open courts and all that, we can close our, our, our doors and we don't have to tell people what we're discussing there. And it's an interest-based process. And when we talk, that, when we talk of something based, being interest-based, it seems we are simply moving away from the, legal, the legalese. What exactly do these people want? Does somebody want the orange pills and another on the and another on the juice or what is it? Does one want to sit back and the other one work or how is it? Or the pro profits to be shared differently? So that is now when conciliation comes in and and comes in very handy when we are getting into into the interest based aspect of resolving issues that have arisen. Parties seek to reach an amicable dispute settlement with the assistance of a conciliator who acts as a neutral third party. What can be referred to conciliation? As I was explaining to you in part, in, uh, part four of the Labor Relations Act, there are two very clear areas that matters can go to conciliation. The matter must be of a civil nature, e.g. termination of employment, that is redundancy, or breach of contract. You cannot have issues, issues to do with fraud, cannot go to conciliation. Issues to do with uh, stealing cannot go to conciliation. Issues that have a criminal nature cannot be under normal circumstances be resolved through conciliation. 
particularly once you've put it out. Once in a while, you once in a while I've seen parties trying to remove a criminal matter from court, but sometimes it, the, the rigors of removing it sometimes are very hard. But uh, but when 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 it's conciliation, it's it's straightforward. Once even if it, the matter is in court and you say fine, it's in court, fine. We have no problem, but now we want to go the conciliation way. It will be it will be agreed. But when it's a when it's a criminal matter, you cannot go to court and tell the judge that you want to agree on this matter in a conciliatory uh, uh, angle. So that, that is where the the difference is. So frauds, uh, money laundering, and such things. Now those are the kind of matters that will not go through conciliation. So section section um, section section sixty two of the Labor Relations Act. Uh, I'll just go through that very quickly. The, the conciliation proceedings commence when a trade union is reported to the minister. That is when the conciliation uh, proceedings begin. And that's when I was telling you there's the element of the section 65 and 70. Then uh, a party is served by hand or registered post to any person having direct interest in the dispute and satisfy the minister that the copy has been served on each party. So by the time you're going to, so by the time somebody is making, going to the minister to declare that there's a dispute and all that, then the, 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 the proceedings of the declaring that there's a dispute has to be served to all the parties that are interested. And the copy is also served to the minister. That means now it's now a different game ball altogether. It's not like in negotiation when it's just the two of you. And then you find when it comes to labor, labor does not provide so much for mediation. There's this mediation. But when it comes to labor issues, we, we, we tend to skip the mediation part because then once this matter is reported to the minister, the minister will want a report. And once there's element of the, of the report, then you see the element of confidentiality as is, is a bit different in this case. So the, res the respondent shall file to the minister a replying statement within 14 days of receiving a copy of the report of the dispute. Now it becomes mandatory. See, once, once it has been served and the ball starts rolling now, you have no choice. The, con the conciliation process has begun and there's the way now the law provides for it. If you find yourself not, if you, if you find you're not replying within those 14 days, then you can be caught to be liable and then it will be like you are also not interested in having harmony in the sector. Mind you, my, quite a number of these matters that go to the Minister of Labor are matters that affect the whole community. For example, when it is nurses and all that, nobody wants to see uh, a destabilization of the economy due to labor issues uh, that have not been given a, a due, have not been given due attention. And that is why you find that the minister is copied in. Because again, those are essential services. And should people die in case of this? The minister will ask, the nurses are, why? How, how come you don't know about it? And that is why you find the law becomes very, very clear when it comes to these things that are of, or that are of public interest. So any other part having an interest in the dispute should file a statement of interest with the minister within 14 days after receiving a copy of the dispute. It's what I explained to you because a party may be served, maybe one or the other, but any other person who is, have, who is aware of that matter and has an interest in the matter, they should also file their case. You know, like right now it's been devolved. Huh? You find there's, 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 the, there's the national government and then we have the, we have the counties and all that. So sometimes you can find even in the, for example, in the Ministry of Health, it's not clear sometimes where these nurses are falling. Are they falling under the national government? Are they falling under the, under the governors or what is it? That is why you'll find sometimes it is served, for example, upon the nurses, and maybe it is uh, maybe the national government. You'll find the gov now the governors also now also filing in something very very very. They're also filing filing in their proceedings because they are an interested party. Being that uh, the, being that some of these nurses have been employed at the county level. So within 21 days of trade dispute being reported to the minister, the the, the minister shall now appoint a conciliator. The conciliator, just as I've said, is a neutral party uh, without any, using any four six to find the middle cause for mutual agreement between the disputants so that the deadlock is brought to an end at the earliest possible moment. From the time now the conciliator, from the time you are appointed as a conciliator, it becomes very, very important that you use all the skills that you have learned in ADR uh, 
as a conciliator and without any force you know some but some of this force it has to be gentle force and you have to you have to be gentle they, you you have to be gentle in how you're dealing with these people because when it looks like you're being too forceful then it 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 throws off the it throws the matter off balance and it now becomes no longer amicable so you have to use all your tactics to make these parties cool down and see how you can resolve to the very end and have an amicable solution uh, as as the matter proceeds so he tries to bridge the gap between the two contending parties because sometimes when it is strikes, you find somebody wants 20% increment, another one is offering zero. So you're trying to see, how, how you're trying to get them to talk. Yes, yes, you want 20%, this one is offering you zero. So why don't you, is that 20% reasonable? Can you at least give them something even if, even if it's 10 or whatever? You hear what this person is saying? It's almost like, 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 um, like caucusing in, in, uh, in mediation. But now this one, we have minutes. By the way, when it comes to conciliation, you have minutes for every meeting. So whatever amount they talk about, you go to these other people again. And sometimes you bring them back together. You see if they, if they will reach a place and agree. Sometimes you find that the issues where they don't agree, something very small, sometimes very small. And interestingly, you find again, labor, labor is an interesting, labor is an interesting, um, is an interesting entity on its own. It also has its own rigors again within there. It, only, it has its own small laws as to who can sit on the table and negotiate. So it is something you also have to understand how a trade union is recognized, who is a trade union and who can say and do what. So they also have to be empowered to deal with the matter. And again, usually you'll find like under the trade union, which we'll, we will not have time for this, we have something called a collective bargaining agreement. There are parameters on how a collective bargaining agreement is reached, is arrived at, and how they negotiate based on the collective bargaining agreement. So, do they have a collective bargaining agreement or not? So, as a as a as a conciliator, you'll find sometimes when you get into the issue and we're talking of interest and all that, sometimes you find even a collective bargaining agreement does not exist. So, you try to bridge the gap between the two contending contending parties, and if they don't succeed, you try to reduce the differences as far as possible by tendering advice to them and working out an amicable settlement. And that's why we say that a conciliator, you are more proactive than a mediator. So you cannot suggest solutions, but suggest alternative solutions too, to the parties that you're dealing with. So according to section 66, I'm trying to move fast in the interest of time, uh, who are the, 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 the people that can be appointed as a public officer, any person drawn from a panel of conciliators appointed by the minister after appointing the board, so you see, like I was appointed, we were we are about 14 to 15 conciliators in Kenya at the moment, and it's supposed to be expanded. But the, the issues that have been happening have made the have made have, have made it not move as it was meant to move. So right now we're actually less than um, 14. We're actually less than 14 gazetted conciliators in Kenya. But one of the things we are supposed to do is also, but COVID also came and brought in a lot of confusion. We are also, we are supposed to also coordinate and have other conciliators under us because you find in the labor sector, there are usually very, very many, very many, very, very many wrangles that never come to the public. And the reason why they never really come to the public is because conciliators are picked very fast and they deal with the matters as fast as possible before they can be, because before it can be toppled, they toppled. So the minister may appoint a conciliation committee which should consist of a chairperson and an even number of persons drawn equally from lists submitted to the minister by the employer in trade union representatives respectively on the board and secretary of the conciliation committee. In my experience, I found that at the labor many times, the secretariat of the minister of labor are the ones who usually do the secretarial work. Oops, time is. Then section 67, powers of conciliator, you can mediate between the parties. You can conduct a fact-finding exercise. You can make recommendations or proposals to the parties for settling of disputes. You can summon any person to attend a conciliation. Depending on what has been presented before you, you can also demand some documents because the, you are covered by the Labor Act and there are some specific uh, provisions that we use. Then we can question persons present at the conciliation. We are actually more proactive and you find we are given a bit more power and uh, rightfully so, as in you can tell, you, rightfully so actually you can just demand that no, we must proceed or somebody must attend the next meeting or you can even stop and say, until this person comes, we are not continuing. So um, 
once the once the dispute has been uh, has been uh, uh, once the the dispute has been resolved, it should be recorded in writing and signed by the parties and the conciliator and uh, signed by the parties and the conciliator and um, and a copy to be lodged with the minister because you remember the minister is the appointing party. So even if it has come through sometimes the court, you find because we are doing it under Ministry of Labor, a copy of that must go to the, minister, to, the, to the minister. And you'll find usually a copy will also go to the judiciary because you, said, you find we have done a lot of fact finding and we have given our views. Based on that, then it usually guides the judge on how to move on from there. So uh, if a dispute is unresolved and uh, we can give you a certificate showing that it has not been resolved, but what I know is that we really, really avoid giving a certificate of showing that the parties have not agreed. So if there is need, if there is need for extension of time, then uh, it is applied for, it's applied for. So advantages of conciliation, uh, party autonomy, expertise of the decision maker, time and cost efficient, and it ensures confidentiality. Because as I was telling you, we, 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 we meet, but it doesn't go to the public. So generally, a conciliator does not follow the same procedure in every case, because people will present their cases to you differently. There are some, you'll find sometimes you're dealing with a matter, they don't even have a collective bargaining agreement to start with. Then sometimes you find you're dealing with a matter, there's something that they had already agreed in the past, and put it in writing. But due to technicalities that are there, it cannot move on. You see, for example, pre-COVID, maybe they said they could give a 20% increment in salaries. But due to COVID now, things have changed. And when there are rigors and you go back and a conciliation, there's a conciliation. Now you'll find how you deal with that 20% in 2020 when there was COVID and 20% in 2015, you deal with it differently. So conciliators make adjustments to, to his approach or my her approach strategy and technique according to the circumstances of each dispute. Whew, thank you, I'm sorry, I've just, I just, I realized I was getting into many stories and time was going. Any questions? Uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation and uh, I really uh, acknowledge you, yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I think appropriately for now, we can probably refer to you as a conciliator, Phyllis Elaine Wangwe, <laughs> as um, quite appropriate for uh, um, the role. Uh, I think you 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 you've just ended when we were just starting to now adjust our seat belts to actually sit and be able to get some more. I mean, really acknowledge and appreciate uh, your your time, uh, and also at the same time just for sharing with us the uh, the, the 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 distinction uh, conciliator, what that really stands for, and what it and what it means, and its place uh, in. Uh, the matters that are to do with uh, labor uh, dispute resolution. So as uh, we uh, uh, drop in the queries that had come earlier into the chat, just the first part that uh, I, I would wish to just pick up with you is uh, at the back of it, I hear a strong need for confidentiality uh, because uh, from the discussion that you've given us, uh, conciliators are, are appointed by the Minister of Labor and uh, also you've pointed out that uh, there are quite a number of matters that never come out to the public, they are handled uh, right away. So could you just give us a bit more uh, on the aspect of con uh, confidentiality in the context of uh, conciliators and conciliation? Thank you. You see what, what happens and when we talk of confidentiality, you know, under normal circumstances, when you go to court, it's an open court. So anybody can walk into court and uh, technically almost anyone can publish. But when it comes to conciliation, we only allow in the parties that are allowed to be in. If anybody for one reason or other is uncomfortable with any party in the room, it is stated and the person is asked to vacate. We, we don't encourage again, noise makers who will come and just derail the process. And that is where the confidentiality element comes in. And even when we do the report, even when we do the report, we furnish it to the minister. We furnish it to the minister and the judge. So it is really up to them to see what they will pick from that for the betterment of the ministry, of the better betterment of the community. But we cannot, for example, even amongst us, you'll find we are a group of conciliators and I'm the chair, for example, we, we cannot um, disclose the contents of our reports 
to the public or any other person before they've reached the minister. And even when they reach the minister, we never discuss that after that. We say, if there's anything, we have furnished our reports and you can look into it. Meanwhile, of course, during the confidence, during the process, if there's something we fail, you don't, we don't like or something, we'll always advise somebody, don't stick there so much. And of course, if you're too difficult for one reason or the other, we shall just state that we feel you're being unreasonable. We are free now to do that. That is now the difference between a conciliator and a mediator. You see, as a mediator, once it breaks, it breaks. But as a conciliator, you must give a report at the end of it all and give your views of what you have done and your findings, but not to the public, specifically to the minister. Uh, yes, that is that is uh, quite clear. So I'll I'll share with you two questions that uh, that are there. The first question is, uh, wh what is the training that is taken so that someone can become a conciliator? I think you pointed to us uh, your own uh, journey. You uh, received an appointment in the course of uh, doing your work. So what is uh, for someone who is, has now had your message and is interested in that pathway? Uh, what is the or, or pathway opportunity to be able to either train or to acquire the the the, the, the mentorship uh, so that they can become a conciliator? And then also secondly is uh, the inquiry on what is the academic qualification so that someone can become or can be uh, can become. And then also secondly, there is the contest of can be appointed as a conciliator. So you may kindly take that as we also have the other ones. Thank you very much. Okay. When it comes to when it comes to training as a conciliator, the most the, the most known institution is ITC Turi. It does uh, it does training for labor institutions at high level ILO, and uh, the fee. Unfortunately, I think it's what has not maybe encouraged so many people to get involved. It ranges between one hundred and five hundred thousand for a period of two weeks. Uh, however, under SEED, we are trying to work out with some of the those that have already been trained to see if we can come up with a program for the locals in, in quotes, but so that we can just ensure that more people are trained. Because the truth is, at, 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 at the end of it all, you find that when it comes to conciliation, th there are so many issues that actually require conciliators. Simple basic issues like uh, a housemaid and the employer. Within Ministry of Labor, we have officers who are trained as conciliators, but that is just within the Ministry of Labor. But as we had discussed with them, just that COVID came, but we were on the path of seeing how do we get this conciliation out more. We are on discussion, we are in discussion some with some of the ITC graduates to see how we can come up with some, um, some courses and a seed and uh, just see how we can have the word out there so that by the time the, by the, time the law is out there because you find that there is provision in the Labor Relations Act for the Mediation and Co Mediation and Conciliation Commission. You find to date there has been there has been some um, it has not flowed. You know some of these things they go to court, but it keeps being returned and it has never really been finalized. So once that one is finalized, then conciliators will be needed. So for me, I'd say once we roll it out, it's just good to get trained. Don't wait that until that, that law is out properly to get trained. You get trained and uh, let it be out there that you're trained as a conciliator. And I'm sure you'll be invited for some matters here and there. Academic qualifications, I believe just as we have right. said, when it comes to ADR, basically we wouldn't really, not so much academic qualifications, but for example, Ministry of Labor, what do you need to be employed, for example, at Ministry of Labor? In different levels. So I imagine that is your your some diploma of some sort, some degree, you know, so that you can be able to lead to work at the Ministry of Labor and lead with disputants. Then from there, conciliation now becomes an add-on. Because conciliation, you have to understand the labor law very well, particularly in the labor sector. And I imagine if it comes up in any sector, whichever sector conciliation will come up, you have to have a good grasp of the law there. So that when these disputants are, are, are arguing and you can equally write a good report after that, that makes sense. I think those are the two. Uh, yes, uh, thank, you, thank you for that, Clark. Yes, 
yes, thank you for that clarification. I think the main thing that uh, seems to be around the development of the alternative dispute resolution uh, field is uh, something that seems to be a bit gray. There is a lot of uh, work opportunity, but there is a gray area with regards to the development of the people in, 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 the, in the particular fields, whether it's uh, in uh, uh, mediation or uh, the uh, negotiation, uh, conciliation. And I think that's also what makes that fluidity is also what helps to enrich this work because then we can have practitioners who now actually support the development of this work in the area of training uh, and capacity building, in the area of uh, mentorship. And I think it's exciting to hear that uh, as uh, so the, the seed center that uh, you're a founder, you're looking at how to be able to uh, advance this work. Uh, we will be able to take a question or a comment from uh, Flo Odwako. Flo, good evening. Good evening. How are you? Fine, thank you. Wonderful. I, I hope you're very, very well. And it's, uh, thank you for uh, being here today. I, I hope you're well. Yes, I'm fine. Okay, please proceed on with your question or your comment, and we may kindly request you may introduce yourself uh, just for familiarity with you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Flo Duaco, and I'm a HR professional. I practice HR. Yes. Uh, thank you, Phyllis, for that wonderful presentation. It's excellent. My question is uh, when, um, I don't know whether I'm loud enough. Uh, when a CBA negotiation is going on, the parties have not disagreed. And then the union goes ahead and reports a dispute. Then the minister appoints a conciliator. Then the, the employer gets the letter from the minister of the, on the dispute. And then they decide to call the union to continue the negotiations. What happens in that case? Just a minute, the employer calls the union to con continue the negotiation. Yes, because they had not agreed to disagree. I think the union just uh, went uh, or oh, rushed to report a dispute and the negotiations were still going on. What happens it, because the, the, the conciliator has not come on board yet, but now the employer is like, I don't want to go to labor. Let me just finish this negotiations. You see, if the conciliator has not come on board, then the, concili the, 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 the negotiation can continue. But immediately the conciliator comes on board. You see, once the conciliator is appointed, even in the if your is, sorry? The, the, in the letter, the conciliator has already been appointed. So if the conciliator has been appointed, the conciliator yes. just comes on record to make sure that you people are continuing and finishing. Okay. It just it just now it, it just comes now to just make sure that you conclude because you've already she's been appointed, you see. Yes. So yes. She has a mandate, you see. Her mandate is just to make sure that this thing now does not get off. So the conciliator will just be there to make sure people uh, finish and will report. Now what what they have, what they have agreed that is what the conciliator will report to the minister that now they have agreed there's no problem. Okay. That is just like preempting, just just making sure things don't go off. Okay, but why are you encouraging trade unions to keep on fighting disputes? You only fourteen conciliators in the country; those are very few uh, to handle all these disputes. We are not encouraging them, by the way. We don't like it when we don't like it, but then we don't like it when trade unions are filing these disputes. We don't like it at all. But that is the reality. It's their right. That's the problem. It's their yeah. right to fight. In fact, okay. we, we say there are too many and all that, but it's their right. And sometimes we have just seen, sometimes it's just lack of knowledge. Sometimes they're just, as you have said, you find them going to file when they just, when the negotiation is, is ongoing, yeah. it happens. I have, yeah. I have found myself actually dealing with issues and you find that just that the trade unions have also not, not been empowered. They have not uh, known and understood their roles. So you find okay. now yourself as a conciliator having to take them through their roles. Okay. Yes, I've seen it actually happening. What you're saying is actually happening. So I think when they get it from the conciliator, they take it more seriously. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.
Hello. <coughs> Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Yes, okay. I'm Isaiah Ameli. I am a teacher by profession. I'm a trained mediator and I'm a unionist. I represent teachers in Joro Sub County, Kenya National Union of Teachers. There is an observation I've made that uh, occasionally when we have a trade dispute between teacher service commission and NAT, the employer, uh, that is the teacher service commission, do not have high regard for conciliation. Time without number, they fail to come to conciliation until we go for strike. And uh, is there a law or how do we compel uh, the employer or either of the disputing parties to come to the negotiation table and to respect what has been agreed during conciliation because sometimes the employer do not respect or even maybe sometimes the unions maybe they don't respect what comes out of conciliation or they don't even attend the meetings and they go ahead with the strike maybe at, at, until a matter has been so solved politically or not solved at all is there a law to compel people to come and to respect or what do we do in such a situation Actually, the thing is, once once you are uh, once you've been ordered to attend uh, to attend uh, to, to attend a conciliation, you are bound to attend the conciliation. Now, what happens is that these members they don't know they don't know this, and when they don't write, when they don't attend the conciliation, a report is done, and usually what happens is that the report is not in your favor, and it can affect the outcome eventually of the minister or the judge. You see, the, the thing is, if it, you better attend, it, it does not work. But when you don't attend and the conciliator writes a negative report of you not, not attending, then it reflects on you negatively. It reflects on you negatively. And, um, and once you start attending, and of course, there's a way, when, of course now the, the challenge with the conciliators is that we cannot really enforce. Whatever happens, we forward to court and the court will enforce. The court will simply be guided also Heavily guided by what the conciliator now states. It's almost like mediation, and somebody refuses to attend mediation. So, when the report that is written that you've been defiant, fine, as it goes on, it does not agar well on you. But by law, you're supposed to attend. So if you don't, it's okay. We've also seen some people in, in parliament eh, not attending court when they should attend. But at the end of it all, it will, it, will, it will usually come back to bite them specifically when all that is on record. Yes, uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, Isaiah Meli, Isaiah and uh, is there any other uh, comments in the area or you're, you're, you're comfortable, you're okay now with the response? I'm, I'm okay now. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for I'm that okay. inquiry. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Yes, uh, so uh, uh, conciliator Phyllis Wangwe, I think we have had a very enriching um, and understanding and appreciation of just where conciliation or what uh, where conciliation uh, falls in place and where it uh, it, uh, it it does come from from and uh, or what gives it rooting. And I think one of the great things that you also did is was uh, starting us off with uh, the uh, appreciation of the Employment Act and the Labor Relations Act, and I think that is also quite useful for just as um, uh, Madame Flo or, or Duaco has uh, uh, even in her inquiry as a human resource professional, um, and you did uh, bring just bring it out that uh, sometimes the the issue is not not understanding the yeah what what something means and also how we can be able to use it and i really believe that uh, this is a, a very rich area for uh, uh, professional mediators to be to have greater understanding of conciliation uh, take up the opportunities for developing themselves as uh, conciliators and in addition to that the bigger role does come in to be able to educate society so that then society can be able to tap and make use of these uh, great opportunities that are out there and that we have 
that they can be able to make um, use of so that we can have um, a society that has a greater understanding and uh, we can be able to develop and advance uh, the socioeconomic uh, aspects of our society. Because uh, I think just as uh, what uh, was being raised uh, here when you talk about essentially like issues of industrial action and also just a disgruntled employee or an employer who's not satisfied that is uh, just uh, sufficient enough to say that let's see what options or what routes we can be able to make use of so that then the organization can uh, be at its highest uh, level of um, uh, productivity and that's also when the individuals are highly productive and so with that we will come to you uh, uh, as our presenter for your closing remarks uh, then we can be able to have the national anthem and we can be able to close this particular session so i thank you all for joining us this session will be available and uh, with the recording and so you can be able to listen on to it again and uh, if you have any further inquiries or wish to make further connections that is an option available to you by your own choice so Conciliator Phyllis Selene Wangwe, Karibu Sana, you may kindly give us your closing uh, comments on this uh, following this uh, session. Karibu. Asante, thank you very much for the opportunity to just also educate and empower those that have been able to make it today. And just as Isaiah has said, sometimes people don't even don't respect the conciliators. But I, for me, I have seen a shift from the time the conciliators were gazetted. They may have uh, some uh, negative uh, approach to the ones uh, that were not gazetted before. But uh, one thing, again, they should sometimes realize, sometimes the conciliator that you are avoiding is the one who will break the truth and be able to make you negotiate and reach a good conclusion. So rather than avoid conciliation, you'd rather go and disagree there than not attend at all. Because many times that conciliator is neutral. And is that sometimes that neutral that conciliator is one who is going to help the other person look at things from your point of view. So just thank you very much for for the opportunity. I like preaching peace and empowerment. And yes, even in the workplace, in the marketplace, yeah, we are good to go. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending and for the opportunity to share. Over to you, Angari. Okay. So with that, we take this uh, opportunity to thank uh, all who have been able to join us and also those who will be able to share in this recording. May it be of use to you and also possibly to other persons as uh, we do advance on the work that uh, the mediation and dispute resolution professionals can be able to uh, serve in the society. Today has been our day to focus on uh, the alternatives in labor dispute resolution, and we've been having a regional outlook as uh, we started off with uh, Uganda as uh, the, the country of outlook. Uh, during our session today at 10 a.m. with uh, the Federation of Uganda Employers, and um, at this juncture, we have had a discussion on conciliation. At uh, 2 p.m., we, we held a discussion on uh, the international our uh, world day of peace and uh, part of the discussions also uh, just introduced the context of or focused on the need for peace uh, in the workplaces and also we had a good discussion uh, around uh, climate change and just its impact uh, around peace in uh, the morning at 7 a.m we had our women in mediation leadership uh, fellowship hour to start off our day and today evening to close uh, this uh, uh, symposium day uh, the colleagues who are on the Wasiliana Hub Fellowship Program will be having one session, a uh, training, uh, conference training with uh, the Northwest Conference team uh, in the US. So I thank you all for joining us in this session. The questions, uh, we, yes, that has really helped to enrich the discussion. Madam Phyllis uh, Elaine Wangwe, Asante Sana, as a conciliator, and we look forward to the expansion of this conversation in other sessions. So I will lead in the words of our national anthem, then we can be able to close and uh, exit at um, pleasure. Wimbo wa taifa, wanchi ya Kenya. E mungu nguvu yetu, ilete baraka kwetu. Haki iwe ngao na mlinzi, na tukae na undugu, amani na uhuru, raha tupate na ustawi. So once again, I thank you for joining us. This is the Wasilian Hub quarter three mediation day symposium and our session today was on conciliation in the workplace where we are now the opportunities that are ahead and also the challenges karibu sana and uh, god bless you thank you for joining us
Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening.